Okay, hi, this is uh, Mike Morang with Headline Zoo, and I'm interviewing Bob Cosberg. He's Hollywood King of the Pitch. Um, thank you very much for taking the time today. No, I'm more than welcome. I'm looking forward to talking to you and who's ever listening. Okay, great, fantastic. So, well, well tell me, you, um, you're King of the Pitch. Um, tell me about your background. Um, tell me about what you're doing. Well, first of all, let me explain what that means. King of the Pitch is just a nickname that I've been kind of given over the years because it means that I've been known in Hollywood for selling lots of ideas to the studios. And when you go into a studio and you verbally tell a studio executive or any kind of Hollywood buyer your idea for a movie, you're pitching. We all pitch every day and everyone's telling stories and ideas, but most people walk into the studios with scripts, finished screenplays. And most people walk in with projects that are based on having writers attached who are well-known Hollywood writers. You know, they've written 10 other features. Whereas I do that sometimes too. But I also get ideas and stories from all over the world. People know that I have this reputation, so they submit ideas to me. And then I walk into these various rooms where there are buyers and execs, and I verbally pitch the concept. And because I've been lucky enough to establish a reputation for having been known as someone who has good ideas and good stories, not, not, that, not that they're all mine, many of them, as I say, come from all over the world, from people that are listening to this show right now. And uh, when I walk into the room, I pitch the idea very briefly and very simply, and that's all a pitch is, a simple summation of your story, a simple summary of the movie you think deserves to be made. And then people listen to me tell it, and hopefully I describe it in an entertaining fashion, and if they like it, they want to buy it. And I should make it clear that I'm not a manager. You know, I'm not an agent. I work as a producer. I still write. But the person who brings the idea to me owns the idea, not me. So anyone who's listening to this should understand that when we sell an idea, it means that the studio has to negotiate with you, the person who owns the idea. And if you accept the financial payment that they're willing to give you for your idea or your story, and it comes in many stages, then I come along as a producer, not necessarily the only producer, but I team up with production companies and other producers, and I get my fees, my payment, when the movie is made. So I'm actually sort of becoming a teammate or a partner with the people who have the ideas. I don't share in their revenue because it's not my idea. And what's fair is that the person who brings the idea gets paid for that. It's known in Hollywood legally as owning the underlying rights. You own the underlying rights to the project. And my reward is that because I found it and I got to bring it to the studios and I sort of did the legwork and hopefully helped develop it into a good pitch, uh, my reward is to be part of the producing entity. And that's what happens when the movie gets made. I get my credit and I get a fee. But I have to develop a lot of projects for that to pay off because even if you pitch a lot of projects, a lot of them don't get made. You hope that most of them will get made, but there's a high percentage that don't, which is nobody's fault. And uh, since I have to get rewarded financially when a movie gets made, I have to work on a lot of projects because you just never know which ones will get made and which ones won't. Well, let's talk about really briefly I, a, a concept for a story versus the, the whole written out script. Um, sure. it, does it make sense for somebody not to spin their wheels and actually to come up with, with a story idea and then run it by somebody like you to see if it's even going to, you know, Pay? No, it's a very good question, and it's, it's one of the reasons I've always done these seminars and events and told people to check with me and others like me before they sit down to write a script, because hopefully those of us who are in Hollywood day-to-day -day can give them a better sense of what I would call you know, critical relativity. In other words, how does it stack up your idea or your story with all the various projects that have been made in the past and all the movies and TV shows that are being developed today? If you don't really know what's in development at the studios, and most people don't, even if you read Variety and even if you keep, on, keep up on the local news, uh, you're not going to know what your competition is. And you might be setting up to write yourself something that could be a terrific script, but five other people are doing movies that are already on the same subject and are already happening before yours, and it will probably kill your idea. So it's good to find, to find out from people like me whether you're on the right track, whether you have something more original, more unique, more special. It's hard to use all those words because you never know what those words mean until you talk about your idea and talk about your story. And we can compare it and discuss it and figure out whether it is something that has potential. And you also need to know that Hollywood is not always looking to develop the kind of stories that you want to create yourself. Not because there's other things like it necessarily, it just might be too expensive or it might be something too esoteric, too strange, too weird, something that nobody understands, something that you have to take too much time explaining. It might be just too repetitive to things that have been done before. 
So there's a lot of reasons to take your time and evaluate with people like me and others and people you trust whether you should take the time to sit down and write a script based on your idea. Because you know, writing a script could take three months, it could take six months. Whereas coming up with an idea and then discussing it, you could get a lot of wisdom you know, from people and a lot of thought would go into whether you should write your script just by talking to people about it first and then deciding whether you want to sit down and spend all that time writing a screenplay. Because that's really hard. Coming up with an idea is difficult, but writing a script is even harder. Now, everybody and their brother has an idea for a great story. Right. Um, I'm sure there's nobody who's, who's ever not had a great idea for a movie. Um, what constitutes an actual idea, which is, you know, an, an entity, something, you know, uh, an asset, something that they, they sure. could actually pitch and own, let's say? What, you know, well, what, what constitutes ownership? Everything that you create out of your own brain is truthfully something you own. Legally, there's a lot of definitions that go into who owns an idea because when you pitch a one sentence idea, you don't really own it. But if you pitch it to people like me, who a producer who works in this business and wants to help people that have good ideas, my v interest is not in taking somebody's one line idea or else I'd have no reputation at all. My interest is in finding good ideas, helping the person sell it because I get rewarded that way as I said earlier. What constitutes a saleable idea is what's different because like you said, everyone has an idea. That doesn't mean everyone has a saleable idea. And the only way you to define that is to discuss each idea separately. People have to email me their ideas, or if I meet them, they pitch it in person. And I give them my opinion. And it's just my opinion. Sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong. But I have to believe the idea is saleable just based on what I do every day making my living in Hollywood. The best cliche I can give people to make them understand is exactly what you said. Since everybody has an idea, your mother has an idea, your brother has an idea, you have an idea every time you wake up in the morning, you might have dreamt something the night before that you can call an idea. And there's that cliche that says ideas are a dime a dozen, which is kind of a mean way of putting down people who have ideas, saying their idea doesn't mean anything, it's not worth anything. And I don't think that's true either. I've always wanted to change it to say bad ideas are a dime a dozen, good ideas are one in a million. Because every now and then, I hear an idea that I just know in my gut instinctively is really commercial. It's going to be easy to understand, easy to pitch. Everyone's going to enjoy hearing it. They're either going to think it's exciting and suspenseful and want to know what happens on the next page, so to speak, how it turns out. Or it's so funny, the minute you hear the concept, you think it sounds like something that's going to be very entertaining because it makes you laugh just to envision it. When I hear ideas, my brain is already thinking like, how is this going to be a movie on the screen? And if it makes sense to me and it sounds funny or it sounds thrilling or it sounds like there's room for a lot of action and adventure, again, it's just my opinion, but I have to believe the idea has that kind of commercial potential. And that defines for me the difference between someone who just says, I have an idea, and someone else who walks in with an idea that when I hear it, I believe it has that tremendous commercial potential to be a big Hollywood movie. Those are two different things. But there's no way to really define it until we talk about ideas that I've sold, which I can give you examples of those, or ideas that I passed on because they just didn't sound like movies to me. And maybe as we talk about it, it will help people who are you know, paying attention to this today get a better understanding of whether the idea they're thinking about doing is a movie or not. I'll give you one other quick example, uh, sort of what I was just describing that we could do. When when Brian Grazier, famous producer, was first developing Splash, that's a simple movie that everyone has seen and enjoyed and helped Tom Hanks' career, certainly, and producer Brian Grazier and director Ron Howard. But it was just a romantic comedy about a guy who meets a girl, except the girl is a mermaid. Now, the reason it's important to stress that is because there's a million pitches about a guy who meets a girl and falls in love. So let's say one of your ideas that you've decided to pitch to me or other producers is the, the latter the one where you're going to say, you're going to walk in and say, I have this great idea for a love story. It's a guy who meets a girl and they fall in love. Well, that's not a good idea. It may turn out to be a great script because you'll have dialogue and characters and scenes. But as a pitch, the people I'm pitching to are going to look at me and say, a love story, a guy who meets a girl, but why is it different? Why is it special? Where's the unique hook? So when Brian Grazier was pitching a guy meets a girl and she's a mermaid, you might not love that idea, but you can see what I mean by one of these stories has a hook. 
it has something special. It has something that differentiates it from the millions of pitches that are just traditional straight love stories. So when people pitch to me, the question they should be asking themselves about their own ideas, which is exactly the question I would be asking them if they were sitting here, is, okay, you just pitched me that idea. Now tell me why you think it's special. What's different about it? If you can't look at yourself in the mirror with your idea and sort of face the hard, cruel fact of saying, what's different about my pitch? Where's the different part? Dustin Hoffman in Tootsie wanted to be a famous actor. So he dressed up like a woman because he couldn't get a job as an actor. They weren't hiring him. So he had to pretend to be a woman. And it turned out to be a very funny story about a guy dressing up to be a woman and then becoming famous inadvertently as an actress. And then he was sort of stuck with the role he created. Now, there have been a lot of movies about guys dressing up, putting on dresses. Some Like It Hot was that sort of movie. Uh, Robin Williams and Mrs. Doubtfire was that, some kind of, was that same kind of movie. Guys in Drag is a traditional joke of a movie. But even in those movies, the writer could say, okay, there have been movies about men dressing up as women. But here's why mine is different. Mine I'm going to call Tootsie because it's a guy who wants to be a famous actor. Robin Williams, Mrs. Doubtfire, you could say it's different because he wants to be close to his kids. He's divorced. He's a single parent. And he's going to dress up like a woman to be their nanny. Some like it hot is Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon. And they're on the run because they've witnessed a murder. So they have to dress up like women because they're hiding out from gangsters. So those are three separate movies, all from the same pitch men dressing up as women, but each one has a special hook. And if you've noticed, I just pitched three movies in 15 seconds. Most people think they have to take 20 minutes, 30 minutes to pitch a whole story. All I want to hear is a simple two or three sentences, which in Hollywood they call the high concept. It can be a thriller, it can be an action movie, it can be a comedy, but it doesn't have to be more than three or four sentences or a paragraph. People will send me a page, or they'll send me an outline, or they'll send me a treatment, but if you can reduce it to a paragraph where I can just understand what the plot is, then you've got a high concept because it's based on the plot. That's what we need to know when we're pitching. You anticipated my next story. By the way, I should have booked you for five hours. I didn't know you were this good. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. So, so, no, okay, well, my next question is, how long, you said one paragraph. If somebody comes in with an idea, how long should it be? When someone comes in to pitch, I would say they can pitch for two or three minutes, but we should be able to re they should be able to tell me or I should be able to help them reduce their two or three minute, maybe five minutes at the most, pitch down to that paragraph that still summarizes what the movie is about. So there's really two stages. There's the verbal pitch, which you can certainly talk for two or three minutes in a room, maybe even five to ten minutes if you have a really great story, that tells the story with a beginning a middle and an end. The classic, you know, Socratic structure of what a, any kind of good story is. What's the setup of your story? What are the complications in the middle? And how does it resolve with the conclusion in the end? That's, that could be a minute, two minutes, three minutes as you tell the beginning, middle, and end. I would equate it to a sixth grade book report that you used to do in school when you read a 500 page novel over the summer, but you had to stand up, stand up in front of your class and summarize it. You couldn't tell every single scene from this book you loved so you would tell what it was a little bit about what it was about who were the characters what happened to the characters the trouble they got into or the dilemmas and how it was resolved when I go into pitch to the studios I will say I have a high concept comedy and I'll talk about one or two sentences that give the whole idea of the movie in just those two or three sentences like we were discussing before that's defining the high concept then they'll say, okay, we kind of like that. We see, we agree with you. It has potential. Tell us a little bit more. And then you, you're prepared to tell a beginning, middle, and end, which could be, as I say, anywhere from a couple minutes to maybe five or ten minutes at the most. Very few people can go on for 15, 20, 30 minutes without losing the audience's attention. And at a studio or with any of the buyers, the phones are ringing and people are coming in and there's lots of meetings. You want to grab their attention with a high concept. There was a, a project that was brought to me by a writer from New York. I used to write with him. His name is David Simon because I want to give him full credit. And he said to me one day, what if a guy wanted to meet the perfect girl? And he went down to the New York Police Department with one of his friends, and he had this plan. First, you think it's going to be a blind date story. There's somebody he wants to meet at the police department. But when he gets down there, 
with the encouragement of his friend, he tells the police that a girl broke into his apartment last night and stole all of his electronic equipment, all of his Sony recording equipment. But he wants to describe what this girl looked like. So they bring out the sketch artist, the police sketch artist. And he asks, what does this girl look like who committed the crime? And our hero of our movie, our young Zac Efron type, proceeds to describe a girl that we know he's just making it up. This girl doesn't even exist. So when he's walking out of the police department, the best friend says, okay, Zach, why did you do that? And he says, and this would be the hook of the high concept, he says, hey, I've now turned the New York Police Department into my personal dating service. If this girl is out there in New York, let them find her. And we go to credits, and the title of the movie is Drawn Together, and you know it's going to be a romantic comedy about a guy who used a sketch artist from the New York Police Department to help him find the girl of his dreams. The comedy comes from the fact that the girl of his dreams is probably going to be a criminal, and she's going to turn his life into a nightmare. And how will he get out of that? And will they end up together? But that was a pitch I just told you in less than a minute. But the high concept, if I had to ask the writer, David, okay, David, tell me, why is your love story, why is your romantic comedy different from all the millions of other love stories? He would say, because I don't think there's been very many stories, if any, that ever had a character use a police sketch artist in order to meet the girl of his dreams. He found something different. He found something funny, unusual, clever, smart, all of the above. That comes from thinking about your idea first, and then we work out the pitch, and then we work out the story. But if you don't have the high concept hook, or the gimmick, or whatever word you want to use, and people use the word gimmick like it's a bad thing, but a lot of successful movies, and I reference Tootsie and Splash, those are movies that have gimmicks, because I don't mean to say gimmick as a cheap word. It just means that the story has something special about it. Right. You mean a, you mean a hook. Now, do most of the people that come to you with ideas, are they also the person that writes it, or are there a group of people out there who are just great ideas people, but they're not about to, to sit down and write a whole script? That's a great question. The reason people contact me is because they have a good idea. Then the second question is, are they writers? If they are writers, and a studio will accept them as writers because they've written a spec script, or they've written something as a sample, or the idea is just so good that the studio is willing to take a chance, then we sell the pitch, and the person who created it is attached to write the first draft. Other people freely admit that, like you said, they have a good idea, they're known as people that have good ideas, they're idea people. I think I'm an idea person. I like to write, but I also think that my ideas are sometimes better than what I might be able to do as a screenwriter. And I like being able to pitch a good idea and let the studio hire the best possible writer. Now, for people listening, if they have an idea and they want to sell it, but they don't want to write, that's their choice and they tell it to me up front and I say fine and once I sell the pitch they still have to get compensated for their story and we didn't get into this but one thing that people want to know is you know how how do people get compensated when it's just an idea well, first of all I hate that expression because a good idea is not just an idea it's a great idea that's going to hopefully generate millions of dollars for everyone you get paid up front by the studio they have to acquire your idea before they can hire a writer so we negotiate and you get a lawyer or I hope you get a lawyer and the person negotiates to get anywhere from, you know, there's a ballpark number. It could be $5,000, it could be $25,000. If you write up a treatment, it could be even more. And that idea is now purchased by the studio or it's optioned. And then once they've optioned it, you still have a contract. And that means that during the course of the development, there's other points in the history of your project as it moves along where you keep getting paid. There could be a point when they hire a writer that you now have to get paid more money. There's a point when the movie's made and you get a story bonus payment because now your idea that they paid you for initially is actually being produced as a film. If they're making your story into a $100 million movie, why shouldn't they give you a big bonus because they can clearly afford to give you $50,000, $100,000 for your idea because your idea was the basis for this movie. So we build it into your contract that there are payments along the way, including profit participation, if the movie is a huge hit, so that if a sequel is made, if a TV show is made, those are all things built into a contract that protect the person who brings me or other producers the idea, because you're the creator 
of the idea. You're the creator of the concept. You're the creator of the story. Will you get credit? That depends on if you have written up a one page or a two page or a treatment because that gets looked at by the studios and by the Writers Guild. And everything that's written on any idea, and even if there's 15 scripts, 15 drafts of your idea, if you wrote the original concept down, you might get story credit. You might get shared story credit. That's, that's totally up to the Writers Guild. It's not something that I can ever legally define because the Writers Guild looks at, and the studios look at every piece of written material to figure out how the idea started, which is why you have a good chance of getting credit if you brought the idea and you started the whole process, and how much was done to keep your idea the same as you wanted it to be. If it changed a lot and your idea took place in Los Angeles when you created it, but now it's a science fiction movie that takes place on Mars and really doesn't even sound like anything you created in the first place, you might not get credit, but you'll still get paid. Great, great. Hey, Bob, um, one of the reasons I was really excited about talking to you is you're not just looking to the usual sources to get these ideas. You're looking outside of Hollywood. You, you've, you've got a um, website, moviepitch.com, and you've got an app for that purpose to, to reach out beyond Hollywood and get those great ideas. Tell me about that. Well, it all started because as I was developing my own pitches and working with my writing partner, we were not running out of ideas, but we were recognizing that no one person has an unlimited source of great ideas. Many people have thousands of ideas, but they're not all great. And the more we asked other people if they had a good idea, the more we found we had success in pitching. As long as we told the studio up front that this wasn't one of our ideas, it was something that came from somebody else, we found that nobody cared where an idea came from. Hollywood likes to present the fact that all screenwriters create their own ideas, and that makes people feel who live in Iowa or Hawaii or you know, in Europe, knows you know, Alaska could be anywhere, that they can't get their ideas to Hollywood. And I sort of recognized that there was that misunderstanding or there was that confusion. Because as I say, a good idea, and as you mentioned, can come from anyone and anywhere. So I started pitching ideas that were mine and my writing partners to the studios. And then I started pitching ideas that were coming to me from other writers who read about what I was doing and realizing that those ideas were many times better than mine and deserve to be made, certainly deserve to be set up and sold and developed. And the more people heard about the fact that I was one of the few producers, I guess, that was willing to look at ideas from people anywhere in the world, not just Hollywood, then I got that reputation as being someone who was a producer that didn't limit what I do to just writers in Hollywood. And it kind of gave me, a, I think, an upper hand on a lot of producers who only want to meet with writers in Hollywood because they're missing out, I think, on great ideas. The best example I, I like to use, because it's kind of like a simple one to explain, I call her the little old lady from Ozark, Arkansas, because I never met her, and I don't know how old she is. I think she's in her 60s or 70s, so she's not really, really old. Maybe she's older than the teenage audience. But she read a story in a parade magazine supplement, probably in the Sunday newspaper in Ozark, Arkansas, that mentioned a man who lived in the Statue of Liberty. So when she emailed me that she had read a story about a man living in the Statue of Liberty, for me, that was where my antenna went up right away, the radar the mechanism in my head, wherever it is, that says this is a high concept because most people don't know about a man living in the Statue of Liberty, and I certainly didn't. So I called her back and I said, could she document this story? And she sent me the article, and sure enough, she was right. There really was a period of time where there was a man living in the Statue of Liberty. She even had a great title, which she called the Project Keeper of the Flame, and I told her that is a great title. And we ended up getting Ryan Murphy, who created Glee, and a lot of people know who Ryan is, to write the first draft. He got paid by Universal Studios and a company called Working Title that made four weddings and a funeral. So that woman from Ozark, Arkansas, got paid for bringing me the Keeper of the Flame project, the man who lived in the Statue of Liberty. And I'm attached as one of the producers if the movie's ever made. So that little story, which that woman in Ozark, Arkansas, didn't make up. She didn't think it up by herself. She just happened to read about it. That demonstrates two things that answer your question. One is I accept ideas from anyone from anywhere, and I can sell them. And some people like me can do the same thing. I'm not the only one. And two, the ideas don't even have to be an idea that you created that's original. It can be an idea you read about in the newspaper. Now, if it's a very famous headline story, everyone's going to know about it, and it's not going to do any good. But she found something to send to me that very few people had ever heard of. The very first project I ever sold was a boy who graduated college and went back to high school. And I read about it in the New York papers. It was in the sports page because he was a gymnast. And he got revealed as kind of a fraudulent gymnast because he had pulled off this charade of pretending to be a high school senior. 
because he sort of wanted a second chance to go back to a period in his life and relive it. I bought the rights to the true story, and we sold it to a famous producer, Mike Metavoy, who ran United Artists at the time. The second project I sold was in the LA Times. It was called The Woo Woo Boy. The movie that eventually got made with Patrick Dempsey was called In the Mood. And it came from an idea that I saw in the newspaper. And I didn't know why other people didn't really pay attention to it, but I think this is one of the keys to why I'm successful, and I think I'm lucky to just sort of have this instinct. But it was a high concept, at least that's how it felt to me, because the headline was a boy named Sonny Weiscarver, when he was 14 years old, was known as America's greatest lover. And he was written about in Time and Newsweek. I thought, how could a 14-year-old boy be written about as America's greatest lover? So I did the research. I remember going into UCLA and going on the internet and trying to find out all about who this kid was and find out if it was true. And I won't go into the details, but it was true. He was arrested many times for running off and marrying older women during uh, World War II years in the 40s. So I flew to Las Vegas and I tracked down Sonny Weiscarver, again with my partner David, and we paid him $500. That's all we had to get the rights to his story. And we came back and not only did we sell it, but to answer one of your questions, at that point in our careers, we said, we want to write the script. And we weren't writers. We were two young guys out of college who wanted to be Hollywood screenwriters. And the studio, wanting the idea, paid us to write the script. Now, eventually that script was rewritten, which I think it probably deserved to be. We did a pretty decent job, but they brought in Phil Robinson, who became a very well-known writer-director and was well-known for Field of Dreams and other great movies. And he, I think, was probably the first film he directed. And you can go rent that movie or order it online, and you'll see Bob Cosberg and David Simon were the guys who created the story. And I think we got some story credit. We, uh, I don't think we ended up with screenplay credit. And the movie starred Patrick Dempsey. And as I say, it's called In the Mood. And I only use that example not to boast about a movie that I got made, because it was one of the first things we ever did, but to demonstrate that even then we were doing something that most people don't do, which is just find an idea and pitch it. And if it's got a big high concept or something that sounds a little different and stands out from the crowd, the crowd of ideas, you can still sell them. And even to this day, what I do with ideas, as they've gotten harder to sell because Hollywood has changed, is I package the, the pitch. I take the idea to actors. I take the idea to directors. I take the idea to other producers who might have strong deals at the studios. And as an idea gets packaged, as you get these various elements, the idea becomes stronger and stronger. You have more and more ammunition so that when you walk in the room and you have you know, Ben Stiller and Julia Roberts interested in your project, you're not just pitching an idea, you're pitching a package. And the studio buys it because it's easier for them to take a risk when they see that other people that are people they want to work with have responded. But you have to ask yourself the question, again, what did they respond to initially? The pitch, the idea. It sounds complicated sometimes, but it's really the same thing over and over again. Find a good idea. And if you find a good idea, you can attract people. And if you attract people, you can set it up at a studio, sell it, and you can get your movie made, or you can get a TV series made, or a TV movie made. All of it comes from good ideas. Hey, and let me, um, let me see if I can distill what I've heard from you as far as a good idea. Basically, something that's going to fly, if you're coming up with a good idea, you want something that's familiar enough you don't want it to be so esoteric that nobody can connect with it other than yourself. Relatable. But, but you also want it to have some different twist, something you can hang your hat on an angle. Correct. Um, and then you want it to be doable. The, at some point, the rubber's got to hit the road, and somebody's got to be able to make this movie. Yeah, it has to sound physically possible. You can't be talking about something where they're going to look at you and say, that's an amazing idea, but how do we do it? It can't be so confusing. Even something as successful as a movie like Inception probably wouldn't have gotten made except that Christopher Nolan was you know, such an uh, amazing director and people at Warner Brothers wanted to work with him that he was able to talk about something that sounded a little bit confusing and they, they were willing to take a chance because he had proven himself having made other movies. But in general, you want to pitch things that sound a little bit less confusing, and like you said, not to repeat it too much. But yes, simple, high concept, something you can hang your hat on that sounds a little different, something that sounds doable, those are all key words. And you also have to focus on subject matter that is, tends to be the kind of thing studios want to do. And that's not hard to figure out because we all go to the movies. And what are the, the genres? What is, the, what is the subject matter that are most movies? Love stories, comedies, romantic comedies, thrillers, action movies, science fiction, fantasy. Those are five or six right off the top of my head. As long as you stay in that ballpark, teen comedies, 
would be another one. Those are never going to go out of fashion. Chick flicks, which is a word that people don't like, but they do make movies for, targeted for certain audiences. A Sex in the City kind of movie, a Bridesmaids kind of movie, movies that are targeted towards a female audience, the same way a, a teen college comedy or a high school comedy like you know, American Pie is targeted at the 15 to 25-year-old audience. So if you stay in that safe ground of comedies, thrillers, action movies, fantasies, that's what Hollywood is built on. And the big action tentpole movies that Hollywood refers to, tentpole because it's like the biggest movie of the year for that studio. It's going to be the big movie that brings everybody into the tent, so to speak. Young people, old people, everybody, boys, girls, women, men, everybody wants to see the next Mission Impossible or the next Batman or the next Superman. Those are usually based on big brands, comic books, graphic novels, remakes of television shows, remakes of older movies that have a big name. Those are hard for the average person to create because they don't have a brand built in. But you can still create a big sci-fi action movie that the studios will love that maybe doesn't have any brand at all. So I would stick to those areas if I'm giving advice. And I wouldn't do small little dramas unless you write a script first. Because a small little drama is all relying on characters and dialogue. It may make people cry, it's so beautifully written. But it won't make people cry usually in the pitch. <laughs> right. and that, you know, it's like trying to pitch any kind of great novel, but you have to read the novel. You can't really describe it because the novel is the great author's writing that stands out. Like F. Scott Fitzgerald writes The Great Gatsby and people love it. But if they just tried to pitch the plot, it wouldn't make people jump up and down and say that's the best story I've ever heard. They love it because they love Fitzgerald's ability as a writer. So you have to know when you walk into a room, what kind of story are you about to tell? A lot of people bring me ideas that I think could be great movies, but I know they won't tell well or pitch well in the room. Whereas I make a list of all my ideas, and there's an A list and a B list. The A list are the ones that I know will pitch well in the room. The B list are things I might want to find a writer for and develop them into screenplays because they can still be great movies. A lot of people's favorite movies don't pitch well, but they needed to be written first. They needed to be novels or screenplays first before anybody would pay attention. Great, great. Hey, Bob, uh, we'll wrap up here with this question. Um, wh do you have something that you want to pitch right now? Um, you've got, we mentioned the app. We mentioned moviepitch.com. Um, anything you want to pitch? Is there a place to, for the, 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 the idea guy to go? Well, uh, it's nice of you to ask me the question, and, and I think you've already been nice enough to mention the, the way that I've set it up because I get so many things submitted to me. If you live in Hollywood, and I, I mean, obviously I work in Hollywood, people get to me through their agents and their lawyers, and I'm always open to agents and lawyers calling me who you know, represent people who work in Hollywood. People who don't work in Hollywood, who just have good ideas, the way I set it up so that they can reach me is through moviepitch.com. And that also includes the app. And I also, it also talks about the speaking events that I do where people can meet me in person. That's really the only way to do it because that way people know how to send in material that I will read, and I do personally read everything. As long as it's kept to a short amount of words, I read everything. I can't get back to everybody unless I like something, but I do promise to get back to people via email or via phone if I like something. And then from that point forward, we work together to go try and set it up. And you know every step of the way what my plans are. But if you don't hear back from me, it doesn't mean that I don't want to hear from you again. It just means that one idea you sent in wasn't quite right. Sometimes I can help you work on it and develop it. Other times I'll just probably say that idea wasn't quite right for me, but why not send in another one? And sometimes people that I work with send me four or five ideas every week. Like you describe people as idea people. People who really are good at coming up with ideas, they send me ideas every week, every month, every year. I get 10, 20, 30 ideas. The writer who sent me Movie pitch, I mean, moviepitch.com, I'm plugging my own website. The writer who sent me uh, Drawn Together, David, as I said, was a former writing partner. I mean, he's an idea machine. He's a good writer, but he's also fantastic with ideas. He, for a while there, probably sent me five or six ideas every day. Because, you know, not every idea was brilliant, but all of them had something. Because he's just one of those people who thinks up, thinks differently. That's what he does. He thinks differently. He sees the world differently. And I'm always looking for those kind of people like David who just want to send me things that nobody else pays attention to. You know, when, when Michael Crichton decided to write Jurassic Park, it was just an idea, but eventually it became a best-selling book and eventually it became a movie with sequels and T-shirts and rides. 
But that's what I mean why it's so unfair to say just an idea. That little idea of people walking on the same island with dinosaurs ended up making billions of dollars. So it's not just an idea. And that's why I would encourage people out there to recognize the value of what they do. Ideas are not a dime a dozen. And that's why we're doing this, so I, so I can encourage people. And also I want to make sure people know I'm doing it because it's fun for me. It's fun to help people, but it's also fun to help me make a living in Hollywood because the more ideas I can find, the better chance I have of getting movies set up and made. And this is just a chance to widen the audience. So I'm doing it not just to help people. I want to be really honest about it and say I'm helping people, but I'm also earning a living by you know, finding good ideas, and that becomes what I do every day taking people's ideas along with my own and going out and trying to make a living in Hollywood. Hey, fantastic. Bob Cosberg, the king of pitch, thank you very much. No, it was very nice. You asked some great questions. I mean, those were the things I wanted to explain, and I'm uh, glad we had this chance to do it. Great, Thanks. fantastic. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.